Let us open in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have blessed and kept us not only in your word and uh, the knowledge of you revealed through that word, but that through that knowledge and through that word, we know the, the sanctity of life, the joy and the gift that you've given us in your life. And Lord, help us now as we see Esther plead for her life that the life that she values would also show us its value. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So last week we finished on kind of a, an ironic reversal, right? Where uh, Haman had been celebrating his amazing uh, uh, reception by being invited to the queen and, you know, bragging and all this stuff. And then Haman goes to the king to ask to put Mordecai to death. And when he goes, he ends up getting looped into parading Mordecai around on the king's horse with the king's clothes and and uh, praise is Mordecai for being a good person, someone the king desires to, to show favor. Uh, and from there, he goes back to his home, head covered and uh, just depressed, and he's sad. And the people, his his own family, basically tells him, "Well, you know, this person who you've begun to fall in front of is going to be your downfall." And well, we see his downfall here <laughs> in the in this uh, chapter. Okay, so any questions from the past? No? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. Oh, sorry, one other thing I should mention. Uh, he was literally rushed off to this feast because he was all depressed and sad. And, and the king's attendants came and they rush him out, basically. Almost, I mean, the, the way the narrative portrays it is basically his friends and his wives and his wife tells him, you know, you're going to have a downfall before this guy. And then immediately the king's servants rush him off to basically, as we know, have his downfall, okay? So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish? Queen Esther, it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Azuera said to the Queen Esther, who is he? And where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and, and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the, world left, as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs and attendants on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. On that day, King Azuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. All right. Thoughts right off the bat. Didn't so it says on the second day, but what this actually meaning is, is the second feast. It's not the, the second feast lasted two days, but that 
on the second feast this happened. Yeah, it is it is awkward wording because it's awkwardly worded in the Hebrew as well. Um, but all the commentaries that I was reading and looking at agree that on the second day was not saying that the feast was two days, but that this is the second. So this is really, you think of the first feast, he goes home, he brags, he and his parent and his wife and his friends tell him, you know what? Wake up early in the morning and build your gallows and then go to the king to ask for him for Mordecai's life. And so that all happened early in the morning. He parades Mordecai around all that after all that day, possibly into that afternoon. And it's now late afternoon, evening. They rush him off to the feast. So this and is here he is. Three days in a row of feasts put on by Esther. Esther. Yeah. The first, the, the first day she requested for them to come for the second day. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions right off the bat? And I be pretty much like that. As they were drinking wine on that second day. On that second day. They're at least they try to clarify it there. Yeah. Um, the problem is the Hebrew is that word and. <coughs> It, well, it does exist, but it's one word for about 15 different conjunctions. And so you could you don't have to put and there. You could say uh, during the second day, you know, and so it's that word for and in Hebrew is very broad encompassing because it's not just and it's and and or it's it's uh, then it's it's. Uh, it's a whole bunch of things. Did you have to take Latin at the seminary? I did not. Latin has a case called ablative. Okay. Which is like that. Oh, yeah. It's a place of a whole bunch of prepositions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why a lot of people prefer Greek because it is a little more precise. There's, there's, there's not as many things like this. But <laughs> there's also very similar issues with conjunctions in Greek as well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so the second day is meaning the second feast, not a feast that lasted two days, okay? And so they're drinking, and that I'd already mentioned previously, this whole wish and request thing. They're essentially synonyms. You could argue that the word wish is a petition with a more personal request um, versus the request word in, in Hebrew is a little more of a generic request. And that does play into part here, because what does she call her wish? <clears throat> what does she call her wish in this? Uh, her life is yeah, her life is her wish, right? It's a little more personal. And the request, the little more generic request, she says, is for her people, right? Okay, but the key, again, though, is that Xerxes is emphatic. He wants to know what's going on. He wants her to just give him this. Why'd you, why'd you stand before me and make me have to grant you a pardon? Uh, what's going on? Why are you, what's so important to you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. And so then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight. Has she found favor in his sight? What have we been told so far from the story? Apparently, or she'd be dead by now. Yes, exactly, right? In fact, when she comes into the throne room to make this initial you know, request for the first feast, it says in the text, she found favor in his eyes, and he tilted this, the golden scepter or whatever and granted her her life, right? Okay, and so the answer to this is yes, she's already found favor in his sight, O king, and if it please the king. Now, here's the second thing, right? The first one, she kind of already knows the answer to. The second to this kind of two-part statement, and if it please the king, she doesn't have a full answer to yet, right? But she's about to find out. But that's the way they address the king anyway, normally. True. Yeah, it is true. Especially mm -hmm. this king, who was flaky as can be. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Because who knows what he was thinking about at the moment you attacked or came into his presence, he might be in a good mood or maybe not. Exactly, yeah. He also doesn't know if he was aware or not who the people were who were that he did this for. Yeah. The only thing she's aware of is that he doesn't know who she what ancestry she comes from. 
he doesn't even know the ancestry between her and Mordecai right now. He knows Mordecai's a Jew, and he just honored the Jews, but that seemingly opposite of the decree he just issued possibly only a few days earlier. That's just because he forgot about it. <laughs> because he didn't even know that it was the Jews that Haman was talking about. Exactly. Because notice Haman never said who it was. Haman described them as a certain people. Right? But mm -hmm. they don't know that he didn't know that. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay? And so then, you know, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. Um, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. What else is she doing right there? According to your thing, she's quoting Haman's edict. Yeah. She's demonstrating that she knows the edict, essentially, word for word. Right? Because those are the exact words used when Haman issued his edict. So probably found that out from Mordecai. Yeah, which he'd found out from Mordecai, exactly. What's really interesting is the king might not even know the actual words, but Haman does, uh -huh. who's sitting right there, right? And he's starting to sweat. Yeah, exactly. About this moment in time, Haman's suddenly getting very nervous, I bet, you know? <clears throat> Uh, just a little side note the word life here O king and if it please the king let my life be granted for me for my wish um, that's the nefesh word again my soul my nefesh my life that word is synonymous with your entire personhood in the Hebrew in other words my entire being be granted to me my very life and soul and and physical body you know, it's this unified whole is what that word encompasses okay for we have been sold as i mean people destroyed killed annihilated if we had been sold merely as slaves men and women i would have been silent for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Okay. Why do you think Esther would have accepted slavery for her people? Because it would have been alive, at least. Would have been alive, at least. Okay. Kind of commonplace for them. They've been sold into slavery as Israelites a few times by this point, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's 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 acceptance of God's deliverance in that, right? Yeah. So yeah. What is the opinion of the commentators on the loss to the king? We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get to that. Okay. Um, in fact, notice I re-asked this question here after this explanation of this upcoming word. The word affliction in verse 4 and the word foe in verse 6 are the same word in Hebrew. Okay? They translated them differently here because of the context and because they're different. You know, it's the same word but used as a different part of speech. Okay? Depend on how you understand the context and the use of this word. The implication could be that the adversary of the Jews was personified in Haman. And so think about this. I would have been silent... For our enemy is not to be compared with the loss to the king. A enemy, this wicked Haman. Our enemy cannot be compared. <coughs> what, what, what do you think that could imply? The if, money that Haman was going to give to... It could be, that's... Yeah. So there's a couple different things here. The, the very traditional and common is that it's the money that's at issue here, right? In other words, you know, you could have sold us and you could have gained even more money if you hadn't killed us, but that instead we would have been your slaves and you would have had everything that was ours anyway, right? Yeah. That's, that's one way to take this, and actually quite a few people take this that way, okay? What's another way to take this? If this affliction is more of a personal title for Haman, since that's what she uses for Haman in just a couple verses, 
How else could you understand this? For our adversary is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Our enemy, our... What is the loss to the king? Yeah, well, exactly. In other words, if we're talking about this could be personified, then you could interpret this not as a loss of finances, but that this Haman, our adversary, is so meaningless that it's not even worth bothering the king about if all it was was us going into slavery. That's how little she could potentially have thought of Haman. Okay? What else? Any other ways to understand this? You know, IV is kind of interesting. It has a note too, which says, if we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Yeah, no such distress. That's how they're distri is how they're translating at that time instead of affliction. Says, I would have kept quiet, but the compensation our adversary offers cannot be compared with the loss the king would suffer. Yeah, or this commentary translates it this way. They try to paraphrase it a little bit more to try to grasp this other meaning. Um, hence the phrase may be understood thus. For the enemy is not equal to, is not worth the damage to the king, i.e., not worth that I should annoy the king with my petition. Thus Esther says, the enemy has determined to bring upon, uh, upon the total destruction of my people if he only intended to bring upon them grievous oppression, even that most grievous oppression of slavery, I would have been silent, for the enemy is not worthy that I should vex or annoy the king by my accusation. And so, I kind of actually prefer this idea that Haman is kind of the personified evil against the Jews. Like the kind of the Antichrist. Kind of the devil, in a sense. Think about that for us in our modern era. The devil is of so little worth in our eyes... That even when he's tormenting and afflicting us, even if it results in our slavery, eh, not worth it compared to, you know, to bother God about. I mean, that's not how God tells us to pray to him. But, but think about it from that perspective, right? That this enemy is of so little account, so worthless before us, that, eh, it probably would have messed up anyway, right? That's kind of how I take it. Like, even if he had tried to sell us in slavery, eh, he would have messed up. You know? well, this is ESV, is it? This is ESV, yeah. It's supposed to be a literal translation. It's supposed to be. And they take it in the literal way of the, of the, of the money, which is the more traditional translation. Um, but as I said, it's not, it's not conclusive. There's a lot of commentaries that go both ways. The other reason why I prefer this kind of personified translation is how does this then parallel with what, what Haman thought about what should be Mordecai's punishment? Do you guys remember that? He, he thought not that he should die. That was too little. Remember, too little. Exactly. It was too little of a punishment to only kill Mordecai. He wanted to kill all of Mordecai's people. And if you take this word in that other way, then that creates an inch, a very interesting parallel of <coughs> Haman is of too little worth to truly be upset about. Except for the fact that they're going to take our lives, not just put us into slavery. So she not only now has Haman afraid, but she's going to insult him on top. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Vastly insult him, right? So it's the theory then that if they had been sold into slavery, Haman would not have been able to expropriate their property and pay the king? No, I think the theory is if you take that understanding of the word, then the idea is, is that not only would have they been slaves and more profitable to the king that way, but all their property still would have been the king's. It would have been more financially yeah. advantageous for him to have exactly. to wipe them out. Exactly, yeah. So and so that's, again, there's two, there's two camps on this interpretation. We need a better explanation then, if that doesn't make any sense. That's, that's, I mean, that's how they go. But as I said, I kind of prefer the... Influ the the um, affliction foe parallel one 
Okay, so with that additional context, why do you think Esther would accept slavery for her people? Uh, knowing that these two words, affliction and foe, are the same word in Hebrew, and she uh, accuses him of being the affliction or the foe, right? Why would she still accept slavery? I think she's just demurring. What do you mean? Well, she's downplaying it. Okay. Downplaying the, the mm -hmm. consequence. Yeah, I don't think she really means it. I think she's just saying that. Okay, that's good. So that could have been two possible alternative losses to the king. One would have been the loss of Haman and whatever he was worth, and the other would have been <laughs> the loss of the Jews. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And one was worth more than the other. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a weird it's a weird wordplay here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so you get a lot of variation, as I said. There, there's a couple different camps on how to understand this. Um, I still like the parallel side of things. Will I, you know, hold that up as divine truth? No. But I find it amazingly coincidental that this then ties more into our day and age in comparison to our current adversary. The devil, right? Well, back then, it was not uncommon for conquering nations to put nations they have conquered into slavery and use them for gain. It was pretty commonplace. So, it, it also. That, if you like, from that stance, she's like, well, I can't exactly be mad at it because this is something that happens all the time, but not thrilled with it. Yeah. That being said, it, it, it's also commonplace. Um, for the, the 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 genocide as well. Sure. In fact, if you yeah. if you even if you just look at Herodotus when he was recording the Persians and their invasion and all that type of stuff, he mentions several other genocides that the Persians committed as well. So this wouldn't have necessarily been out of character to either make them slaves or to commit genocide. It, the Persian Empire had actually had a reputation of doing both. Yeah. So then could the loss of the king have been, theoretically, the, the not carrying out of his degree? If it or, or, from that perspective, the loss of the king could have simply been annoying him with more requests or other things like that. You know, well, it's, he'd have to find a new queen again. Yeah, well, he would have to find a new queen again, yeah. It's a hassle the first time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so that, that's kind of where we, we're going to leave that. I'm not going to give a definitive because I said it is it can really go both ways. But I do find it very interesting that that word is the same word in Hebrew. Okay. Okay, and the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. Okay. How is this kind of an ironic fulfillment from earlier, chapter 6, verse 13? Now we've got an Agagite begging for mercy from a Jew. How about chapter 6, verse 13? Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Yeah. And so we kind of get this fulfillment here, right? It's coming to ruin. It's coming to ruin. He's, he's already begging a known Jew for his life. He's falling down before her, right? As we see, as Haman was falling on the couch. And that's the, back to that same word, the word fall, which is the word for let fall the dice, the casting of the lots. It's the same word as before whom you are now falling, right? This is a very uh, powerful word in the book of Esther because it's part of the entire ironic fulfillment that ultimately God is the person who determines who falls and who rises, right? And so now we've got, he's actually begging for his life from a known Jew, a guy who has an ancestral heritage of hate with the Jews, okay? Didn't King Agag, didn't he uh, uh, beg for his life? 
Well, not so much beg for his life as he thought the danger was past. They got yeah, because they, they, you know, he was spared. Sam, uh, Saul didn't kill him, and so he's thinking, "Oh, surely the danger is past now." As they bring him before Samuel, mm -hmm. and then Samuel says, "You know, uh, before whom uh, you made ch uh, mothers childless, your mother will now be childless," or something like that, and mm -hmm. and yeah. cuts his head off. Pieces. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this word wrath here. Uh, the word is uh, is uh, kind of this red rage is really what it is. It's the same word that's talked about when people are drunk. And it's the same word as when people are so furious, they're kind of like just their face is red. Yeah, boiling. Yeah. And so there's there's this is this wrath is a very heated wrath. OK, um, it can also play into things like uh, the descriptions of poisonous serpents. They're kind of they're they're kind of painted as wrathful serpents because they have this this when you get bitten by by them, then they, you get this burning sensation. Right. And so it's very it's all tied back to this kind of burning heat. OK, that's what the king is described as going through, right? And it's not his heat doesn't leave until the end of this section in verse 10, then the wrath of the king abated after Haman's hound, right? It's not helping Haman's state of mind either. Yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of, not only is he enraged with heat, but he's also enraged with wine, right? He's just been having a drinking party, okay? Uh, so, ironically, this is one of the probably most logical, um, cool-headed things you could expect King Xerxes to do is to take a moment, right? <laughs> Except the funniest thing about this is in this moment, God isn't done twisting the knife, right? <laughs> God's like, okay, Haman, here we go. Let's make this stick, right? <laughs> and, so, and so Haman's falling on the couch. And the word for couch, by the way, is the same word for bed in Hebrew. Okay. They translate it as couch purely based on the context. It, so she's essentially on a bed and he's lying on top of her. Right. This does not look good for Haman. Right. This is not looking good. OK. Um, and the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence? OK. This falling action, you know, fulfilling again, Esther 613. And then this assault word, interestingly enough, actually has all sorts of other connotations. And this is the only place in the Bible it's translated as assault. Normally, it's translated as subduing, enslavement, subjugating, treading upon. And here they translate it as assault because, well, yeah, he's you know, kind of assaulting her, sort of. But really what the king's implying is like he's full out trying to ensnare his wife. That's kind of cool here in NIV. It says, just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Assault, molest, subjugate. I mean, this is, this is not a kind word for the situation, right? Okay? This is not putting the best construction on everything, by the way. <laughs> already have the work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Remember back earlier at the end of chapter six, Haman covered his own face because he was so distraught. Well, now his face is forcefully covered as he's condemned to death, right? Okay. Um, then you get <coughs> Harbona, one of the eunuchs, and the tennis the king said, moreover, the gals, by the way, Haman, guess what I just thought of? You know, <laughs> wow, hey, Harbona, what do you think of Haman? <laughs> 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 Yeah, not well. Like interestingly, though, Harbona is also mentioned way back at the beginning in the incident with Vashti. He's one of the eunuchs who was sent to go get Vashti, the original queen who got deposed. Okay, so he's one of those people. So he's kind of still in attendance, kind of a, 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 a high position, but 
more of the servant side of positions, right? Uh, and so I find it interesting that he's one of the people who help, who God uses to resolve and start this whole thing. And now he's the one that, oh, by the way, guess what, king? <laughs> just, just, uh, it also kind of shows that perhaps King Xerxes should have been better well informed about the going ons of his palace, right? Uh, as Haman's been building this this day, okay? Well, the fact that he didn't pay attention to all this is what made it possible, mm -hmm. I think, for Haman to get this far. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so, you know, moreover, you got this sitting there. And again, the 50 cubits high, uh, I, I still stand by that. I think that what that means is that Haman put it on top of his house or up on the top of an upper story building. I don't think that it was necessarily from ground level 50 cubits, uh, but who knows? It doesn't really matter. Okay. And they said, hang him on that. And so again, this isn't a gallows like we think of a gallows, like with a rope. This is probably an impalement stick. Okay. So you can hang out for a while and show, show off the dead to everyone. Okay. Well, they did that with gallows too. Let the hang here for True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Okay. Again, finishing our kind of ironic reversal. Then the wrath of the king abated. Okay. Thinking about all of this, what is the, what is ironic about the final accusation that earned Haman the death penalty? Especially when you compare it to the accusations Haman leveled against the Jews. What was the thing he leveled against the Jews? Chapter 3, verse 8. What did he say? There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom whose customs are different from those of all other people and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. Okay, is that a true statement? They just didn't. One person didn't bow to Haman. Yeah, this is this is kind of it's kind of like taking something and kind of twisting it in the worst way possible, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was a half truth versus a full truth. Yeah. What about the thing that finally earned Haman the death penalty? Him falling on Queen Esther. Yeah. He took touch with the king. Yeah, but. Was he actually assaulting her? No. No. <laughs> he wasn't actually. It's not like, had he been falling on her? Yes. Was that really the most accurate interpretation of what was going on? No. The Bible records him as begging for his life and just like tumbling onto her, basically. And yet he gets executed, ironically, at a false truth just like the Jews were put up for execution from, by Haman on a false truth. The, the ironic reversal continues, right? Not only that, then that furthers into chapter 8, okay? As we, you know, King Azuerus gave to the Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, okay? This word enemy here, ironically, is slightly different than that foe and uh, affliction word we talked about earlier, but only by one letter. So it's a parallel word. It is technically a different dictionary word, but it's also essentially the same thing. Again, okay, the enemy of the Jews and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther told what he was, all right? And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. Again, um, this was an actual ring that was on his hand, uh, not a signet necklace like was a lot more common in earlier uh, Babylonian days. Okay, And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Notice Esther's doing the setting now. Again, showing that Esther's come kind of full circle in her uh, growth as well, showing from where she was kind of you know, had no choice in anything to now she's doing things, right? The NIV it says, and Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. Mm -hmm. The king took off his signet ring 
Which he had reclaimed from Haman. Yeah, and here it says which he had taken from Haman, yeah. And presented it to Mordecai. Mm -hmm. Reclaimed sounds so much nicer than taken. <laughs> yeah. Taken is very forceful. <laughs> dying. <laughs> You're dying, give it back, yeah. But yeah. He, if he reclaimed it or took it, mm -hmm. that means he did that at that banquet after they covered Haman's face and before they hanged him. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so that where there was a symbolic meaning there too. He's, I'm done with you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts or questions on this portion? So what I put on the end here is there's a couple different archaeological things, and I find these interesting because you know, so many people complain about Esther and they say, you know what, when we look at Esther, we don't see that name recorded in any other the Greek histories or the Persian histories. Instead, though, we, we have this other person. And so that means Esther must completely be false. And we're just, you know, dumbfounded by why the Bible would be so ignorant. The problem with that is that's not actually what the record portrays. In fact, when you consider that the Bible might be the authoritative source and the other things, the supporting material, you end up with things where there's actually a significant amount of credence to this little statuette head figurine that I put for you there on the right, that that might be the bust of Queen Esther. Because this was a unlabeled Persian lady who's basically buried in the tomb with, Queen, with, with King Xerxes. Okay? This portrait of a Persian lady is so controversial that, in fact, a lot of archaeologists try to say, well, that's not even a girl at all. That's just one of the kings that happened to have the label fall off. <laughs> Except every other king in there has a beard. Obviously, she doesn't have a beard and very feminine features, right? <laughs> so, like on the left, you, I guess it's a little obscured, but you can see the beard on Xerxes there on the left. That's a bust of Xerxes as he's walking, I don't know, taking a stroll or something. Uh, and so you get these in here, and it's funny how how dedicated the world and you could argue Satan is to try to obscure the truth of the Bible. You know, because so many of these things, even the, the following lineage that Herodotus records for the queen of Xerxes plays right in line with what the Bible records as for Esther. It all just comes down to what are you taking as your source and what are you taking as your support? But okay. Does mean that Herodotus describes mm -hmm. that resembles Esther? Does he assign a name to her? He gives it like Amorti or something like that. No one ever uses Esther, and that's part of why they say, oh, no, see, see, this can't be it, can't be it. Except Esther wasn't even her real name. Well, that's gonna see Hadassah was her real name. That was her Hebrew name, right? That was the Jewish way. Exactly, yeah. And those records weren't written from the Jewish viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, look at Xerxes, right? His real name was not anywhere close to Xerxes. You know, Azuerus is actually a closer interpretation of his name, but neither is actually his actual Persian name because it's impronounceable in all these other languages. <laughs> so he just didn't use it, right? And so, uh, and so it's, again, you got to understand what's your source, right? Are you taking the Bible as your, as your basis and then using other things to find support Support or to acknowledge the, the truth and the validity of the Bible, or are you completely discounting the Bible and starting with other things that have already shown to have falsehoods? Like one of the big ones is they use this lineage of kings according to the Persian record, and according to that Persian record, there was never any usurpers or any one who took over when they shouldn't have taken over or things like that. No, 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 that never happened according to the Persian record record. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> we don't, you just look at any historic Babylonian, Persian, Median, you know, whatever empire, and they don't exist without usurpers and people. And so you look at a little more 
accurate record. You look at the Greeks and they said, oh yeah, well this guy only reigned for 12 months because he tried to take over this and then that happened and then... It, it, why are you using that when your source you already know that it's false? And yet they're using things like that to try to disprove Esther. And it's like, that, that's ridiculous. You're, you're not focusing on truth. You're just focusing on your viewpoint and trying to support your viewpoint. Okay? So I found these. I thought it was fun. Um, the one on the right, actually, um, is actually part of a guy's master's, not master's, sorry, his PhD, like, thesis. And the funny thing is, he's not, he's not a biblical scholar. He's just arguing for the idiocy of the archaeological community to recognize truth. <laughs> what university is going to reward him with a degree for that? I don't remember which one he was part of. <laughs> uh, but you can go, um, where, where, I think they said this is in Tehran, is where it's in a museum right now. Yeah. I'll give the museum this. At least they label it as a portrait of a Persian lady and don't try to claim it's a guy. It's <laughs> Okay, any final comments or questions before we close with prayer? All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank and praise you that you have blessed us and kept us in your word. Help us always to recognize the truth that we have through Jesus, that you are a God who loves us, and you are the God who sent Jesus to save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>